Good evening. My name is Carrie Kennedy, and, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our 37th Annual Human Rights Award. This year, as you know, is so different in so many ways. At this moment, not only are we unable to gather together in person, we aren't able to physically travel to the places around the world where we are actively working to protect and defend human rights. Today, it is more important than ever to note that our strength lies in our partnerships and our defenders on the ground, from the Amazon to Zimbabwe, and in those who understand the interconnectedness of the world and hold high the value of diplomacy and our inherent duty to recognize the dignity of all human beings without discrimination. We begin this important occasion with remarks from our distinguished keynote speaker, the Honorable John Kerry, which will be followed by the presentation of the award to our incredibly inspiring, amazing 2020 laureate, Alessandra Kurap Mundu Ruku. Afterwards, we will give the floor to an all-star panel moderated by Andrew Rivkin, director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability from the Earth Institute at Columbia University and winner of the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for his book about Chico Mendes many decades ago. To this celebration of Alessandra's work started, it is truly my great honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, former Senator and Secretary of State, John Kerry. Our keynote speaker gained tremendous respect from Americans on both sides of the aisle, as well as people around the world during his nearly 40 years in the United States Senate and as Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. He is one of the most significant Secretaries of State our country has ever known. Secretary Kerry is a relentless and tenacious peacemaker, someone who has continually acted as a progressive and a realist about global environmental affairs, especially about the need for diplomacy over war. Today, our 37th Human Rights Award laureate is a young woman, a budding lawyer who has dedicated her life to vocalizing and defending the rights of her people in the Brazilian Amazon. The plight of indigenous peoples was one of young Senator Kerry's first causes. In the mid-1980s, he worked to gain bipartisan support for the human rights of indigenous peoples at a time of extreme conflict in Central America. Through his work in the Senate and as Secretary of State, he has exposed the lie of greedy corporations who go after a quick buck and say that indigenous peoples are against development. Instead, he consistently advocates on behalf of those opposed to the continued disregard of their self-determination and decision-making processes over their lands, territories, or the natural resources found on those lands. Secretary Kerry's track record includes presiding over the normalization of U.S. relations with Cuba, the historic nuclear agreement with Iran, and significantly establishing himself as a leader in global environmental sustainability as a leading architect of the Paris Climate Accords. Secretary Kerry has dedicated his life to many of the ideals of my father, who noted that if we would lead outside our own borders, if we would help those who need our assistance, if we would meet our responsibilities to mankind, we must first of all demolish the borders which history has erected between humans within our nation, barriers of race and religion, social class and ignorance. Daddy said in his now famous day of affirmation, address at the University of Cape Town in 1966 that each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, 
Those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Secretary Kerry, he must have had you in mind. We are so honored to have you with us today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to be able to join you for the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award presentation and uh, very happy to be part of this presentation process, uh, virtual for all of us, uh, which we are still uh, getting used to and finding challenging. May we all get back to uh, the ability to be able to meet together, dine together, and celebrate together, as I think everybody is uh, impatient for that moment. It's almost cliched to say that uh, 2020 has been a year like no other. Uh, President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy often invoke the old Chinese uh, curse or proverb, may you live in interesting times. And certainly, uh, these are interesting times. They're also dangerous times. There are times when our values are being put to test uh, and times when indigenous peoples particularly are suffering for the degree to which they have been isolated in many cases and exploited in so many others. Uh, Robert Kennedy's sense of conscience helped America in a time that I personally remember very well, the difficulties of the 1960s, helped the world navigate what was then a volatile period of the 60s where the issue of our values and the questions of our survival were literally the day-to-day -day issues in our nation. As it was for Robert Kennedy, uh, the question for all of us was, what could we do individually and what were we willing to do together in order to ensure that our country and the world would answer uh, that question, uh, not just right, but within the right amount of time. And that is the very heart of what we now face with this global challenge of the climate crisis. Uh, and it's not just a question of will we respond, it is a serious question of whether or not we will summon the will to respond in time. And when I negotiated for President Obama in Paris on the climate agreement, when we walked out, <clears throat> I said at that time that nobody should be under the illusion that we had promised the world and guaranteed we were gonna be able to hold the Earth's rise of temperature to two degrees centigrade. We didn't. What we did was create a roadmap to be able to get there, not a GPS on automatic pilot. And it is literally a roadmap through the wilderness, a roadmap that required that we listen to and hear uh, people in so many isolated areas of our world where they suffer the consequences of the climate crisis, but have not contributed to it almost at all. No people have more at stake in the outcome of this struggle, and no people have done more to touch our collective conscience than the world's indigenous peoples, those who do suffer the most for what the developed industrialized world has created. And for centuries, indigenous peoples have suffered oppression and marginalization. And too often their rights have been denied, crushed, annihilated, especially their right to self-determination, discrimination in access to culturally appropriate education, to health services, to justice, uh, to uh, even a seat at the table to participate in the distribution of power or the execution of decisions, all of those are still very real threats to indigenous peoples around the world, as they still are to Native Americans. Indigenous peoples we know are often subject to degrading stereotypes and to assumptions that, quote, civilized people can and should make decisions for them. But as we celebrate tonight in a very special way, we know, and this award in a sense affirms, that indigenous peoples are beyond resilient. They're wise, they're courageous. The rest of us should learn so much 
from them, starting with how to take care of our environment, how to keep our rivers clean and strong, how to keep our lands fertile and healthy, how to take care of our people and our habitat in a sustainable way. As the individual who was privileged to sign the Paris Accords at the United Nations with my granddaughter sitting on my lap, I can affirm to all of you that we have a lot to learn from indigenous people about how not to rob the world's children of their future. The Munduruku people in Brazil are warriors, warriors of many different kinds. And they have survived more than 500 years of oppression, of attempts to destroy their ancestral lands, of attempts to uh, abscond with all of their natural resources. The Munduruku have successfully, amazingly, stopped hydroelectric projects that would have irreparably damaged their water resources and would have negatively impacted the entire Amazon ecosystem. And they actively resisted the constant violent, uh, illegal, and sometimes uh, state-sponsored push by loggers and miners to exploit their land. Time and again, they have stood up to those who invade their territories. They have defied the violence and the intimidation, and they have demanded a proper say in any project that affects their lives. Alessandra, our principal honoree, and the Munduruku people remind us of exactly what it is to fight and what it is to persevere. Alessandra, you are without any question whatsoever one of the most courageous human rights defenders in our hemisphere, if not on the planet. And we should all feel so privileged to be part of this celebration that lifts up Alessandra Korop Munduruku with an honor that reminds us in the words of Robert Kennedy, just how important it is to get people of power to live for the public rather than off the public. Alessandra, you have spoken and continue to speak truth to power. Uh, you fight for the public. Uh, I know those things are easy for me to say. They're tough for you to do and tough for your people to do with you. And it's quite extraordinary the way in which you fight for the planet's lungs the way you fight to protect our land and for all those common goods that we need to strive to save and to share. So tonight, we all commit to fight by your side. And it's with great, great pleasure and pride that I join with everybody in affirming your remarkable acts of leadership, acts of conscience, your courage, uh, and what you have done to preserve and protect uh, for the future. We need millions more of you. So thank you. Uh, congratulations on this terrific honor, the Robert F. Kenny uh, Human Rights Award. And I know uh, you're going to continue to be part of this great battle. I look forward to fighting alongside. Take care, good night, and God bless. Many thanks, Secretary Kerry. In addition to 2020 being a year of change and upheaval and isolation, this has been a year of losses too for people across our globe and for the Robert F. Kennedy human rights family. We lost Congressman John Lewis, a longtime member of our board of directors. We lost my niece, Maeve McKean, her son Gideon, and of course, my aunt Jean Kennedy Smith. We are so happy today to be giving this award to Alessandra Kuru Mundulkuru, a woman who's an energetic leader, unafraid of getting into good trouble in the name of human rights for the Mundurukuku people in Brazil. Throughout history, indigenous peoples have repeatedly been oppressed and subjected to the worst human rights abuses. My father recognized this 57 years ago when he traveled to Bismarck, North Dakota to address the National Congress on American Indians. To these Native American tribes who call home more than 5,000 miles away from the Amazon rainforest, Daddy identified a problem, 
still faced by the Munduruku and so many others today, that the culture and the livelihood of the nation's indigenous peoples have been under attack since European settlers colonized these lands centuries ago. Alexis de Tocqueville, the 19th century French traveler who seemed to know so much more about Americans than Americans knew about themselves, was outspoken in his admiration of indigenous peoples, but disapproving of their treatment by European settlers. Quote, the Indians, he said, have become isolated in their own country, a colony of strangers in the midst of a numerous and dominant people, unquote. De Tocqueville, my father said, was right. Poverty, undereducation, and disease are evil forces in their own right, but perhaps their most destructive effect in a society like ours is that they breed a practical loss of freedom. Indigenous groups, including Alessandra's community, have faced tremendous struggles in Brazil over the years from gold miners and loggers illegally invading and exploiting their land to dealing with widespread Amazon fires and a combative president who's insulted them and proactively removed many of their protections. This year, those threats have been coupled by the increased risk of the coronavirus as indigenous peoples are dying of the virus at a rate nearly double the general Brazilian population. The growing number of cases and the government's sluggish response have prompted allegations of incompetence and disarray in officials' efforts to protect vulnerable tr tribal populations from contagion. Government health care workers, together with illegal mineral prospectors and other intruders, now figure among the principal vectors of infection into protected indigenous territories. Indigenous people are the front line and ultimate guardians of the environment. They are quite literally protecting the lungs of the world. There is no healthy environment if they are not protected. Alessandra exemplifies the core objective that the Human Rights Award has had since its inception to recognize some of the most courageous people in the world who stand out protecting their communities by speaking their truth to power. As one of the key leaders and organizers of the Munduruku people, she has fought to stop construction projects and illegal mining that are infringing upon Munduruku territory, garnering international attention and support. She's advocated for the demarcation of indigenous lands and for indigenous communities to be consulted on decisions that affect them and their territories. Alessandra has also played an important role in advancing the leadership of women in the Munduruku community and among other indigenous peoples in Brazil through her involvement in the Wakaburun Indigenous Women's Association and the Parini Indigenous Association. Alessandra's work defending indigenous rights across Brazil and importantly raising power within her own community to drive change exemplifies the crucial role of civic space in any functioning democracy. Alessandra, know that my dad would be standing alongside you in this fight for fundamental dignity. You keep alive Robert Kennedy's legacy in every vigil, in every lawsuit, in every march, and in every victory. You are creating the more just and peaceful world Robert Kennedy believed was the inheritance of every human being. And now it is my great, great honor to present Alessandra with the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. Meu nome é Alessandra, sou do povo Munduruku do Médio Tapajós. Tenho 36 anos, dois filhos. Atualmente estou morando no município de Santarém. 
para buscar conhecimento das, das leis do homem branco. Por isso, hoje estou na Universidade Federal do Oeste do Pará, graduando em Direito. Nasci e cresci na aldeia Praia do Índio, que fica no município de Itaituba, no Pará. Já fui coordenadora da Associação Indígena Pariri, que agrega as 11 aldeias do Médio Tapajós. Eu sou o chefe de mulheres Munduruku do Médio Tapajós. O povo Munduruku é conhecido como formiga vermelha. Em todas as bacias do rio Tapajós, existe aproximadamente 14 mil Munduruku que pode viver ameaçado pelos grandes projetos do governo, como hidrelétrica, mineração, portos, graneleiros, ferrovia, hidrovia. O Telespires é o rio com maior número de grande hidrelétrica na Amazônia. Foram construídas quatro usinas, Telespires, São Manuel, Sinop e Colíder. As quatro usinas barram o rio, que é um dos formadores da bacia Tapajós. Muitos de nossos locais sagrados já foram destruídos. No rio Telespires, não fomos consultados sobre a construção da barragem que acabaram com Carubicheché e Decocá. E ainda somos ameaçados por dezenas de outras barragens e outras obras que o governo e as empresas querem instalar na bacia do Tapajós. Nosso território tradicional existe desde quando foi criado Carusacaibu. Passou a existir no Vale do Tapajós. O peixe surgiu dos Munduruku. O rio é o nosso local, lugar de nascimento. É dele que vem a nossa força. Não queremos compensações. Queremos nossos rios e nossa floresta vivos. A ferrovia oferecida no projeto é para carregar toneladas de soja e milho e vai aumentar mais o desmatamento. É para sustentar o país desenvolvido. A pandemia, conhecida como Covid-19, matou várias bibliotecas vivas que são muito ensinadas. Nós tivemos que buscar uma solução para salvar a vida dos povos indígenas. A cada dia, nós vemos aumento de invasores dentro do nosso território com sede de explorar, aproveitando que nós estamos em isolamento. Eles querem que nos expulsar daqui, mas estou aqui para dizer que o nosso território não está à venda, o nosso rio não está à venda, a vida do nosso povo não está à venda, o nosso filho não está à venda. O que importa é respeitar mais os povos indígenas, quilombolas e ribeirinhos. Quero aqui... Agradecer pelo prêmio de Robert Kennedy Henry Weiss, pelo conhecimento da luta dos povos indígenas do Brasil e principalmente pelo conhecimento da luta em defesa dos direitos humanos. Esse prêmio vai ajudar a fortalecer a nossa luta em defesa do território, trazer esperança para a resistência. Vai para todas as mulheres, crianças, caciques, guerreiros e guerreiras que está nessa luta. Muitos não ouviram, mas o prêmio de reconhecimento pelos gritos de ecoar a nossa voz, pelos direitos dos povos indígenas. A nossa luta sempre será pela defesa do nosso rio, pela marcação dos territórios que são negados pelos estados e pelos governantes. Nunca vamos desistir da Mãe Terra, que sempre nos deu de graça água, vida e floresta, sem mesmo nos cobrar. Sabemos que a ganância do homem está destruindo o que é mais de sagrado, mas eu acredito que nós podemos mudar essa trajetória. A ferrovia é para carregar toneladas de soja, milho, para sustentar os países desenvolvidos. Chega de tanto massacre que tira o nosso direito de viver no território. Nós temos o direito também de lutar contra essas empresas que estão querendo destruir nossas casas. Eles querem que sejamos museus que não falamos nada. Mas estamos aqui vivos, resistindo, 
por mais de 520 anos. Muitos povos sofreram e perderam sua cultura, sua linha, linguagem, mas nunca perderam o seu conhecimento de ser um defensor pelo de território, de buscar o seu conhecimento de onde veio. A colonização ainda não parou, ela continua. O projeto de lei 191-2020 quer regularizar mineração hidrelétrica e petróleo e vai ser a morte do rio e da floresta. Eles querem vendê-los, explorá-los, mas vamos continuar defendendo essa mãe terra que é a Amazônia, Cerrado, Pantanal. Nós que falamos e gritamos somos considerados uma ameaça, querem nos ver mortas. Eu vou dizer aqui que não vamos nos calar. Eu sei que esse governo não gosta de índio, inventa mentira que nós, povos indígenas e caboclo, queimamos a floresta. Se nós queimamos, já não existiria nenhuma floresta no Brasil que já que estava cheio de pasta história. Ele tenta nos negar o tempo todo o nosso direito, mas eu quero que o mundo conheça a nossa realidade de viver no Brasil. Somos mais de 305 povos indígenas, falantes de mais de 274 línguas diferentes. Temos ainda o registro de 114 povos isolados de recente contato. Nós merecemos o respeito e temos o direito de ser consultado. Queremos ter o direito de dizer não, que os outros países respeitam todos os povos indígenas. Saúde, saúde, saúde. Thank you, Alessandra. In closing, I'd like to quote Guatemalan human rights activist Rigoberto Menchutum, winner of the 1992 Nobel Peace Prize. She said, the mere absence of armed conflict does not necessarily mean there is peace. Peace is not synonymous with the absence of war. It isn't just the silencing of weapons. For me, peace is a way of life, both for the individual and for all humankind. It is a form of coexistence among peoples, lands, and nations, the deeper meaning of which we might call mature human development with total equality for everyone, men and women, children and adults. It is equal access to development for all nations and lands so they may choose their own futures without anyone interfering and telling them what to do. There is no peace without justice. There is no justice without fairness. There is no fairness without development. There is no development without democracy. There is no democracy without respect for the identity and the dignity of all cultures and all peoples, unquote. Thank you again for joining us today for being peacekeepers and beacons of light and truth. Now, please join Andrew Revkin for the panel discussion. Congratulations, Alessandra. Parabéns. And thanks. thank you for those inspiring words and call to action. I'm Andy Revkin. After three decades of environmental journalism, I'm now the director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia University's Earth Institute. Kerry Kennedy started today's ceremony by mentioning how this year is different in many ways. We're in a unique moment in Alessandro's work defending the rights of her community and of indigenous peoples more broadly is in many ways at the crux of the challenges we as a global community face in 2020 and in the years ahead. That makes this a great time of opportunity and thoughtful action as well as a time of sober reflection. We wanted to take this moment to give more context around Alessandra's important work by delving deeper into the challenges that the Munduruku people and other indigenous communities face, and to take stock of them from national, regional, international policy, advocacy, and activist perspectives. To help me do that, I'm thrilled to welcome this distinguished panel. Juarez Saw Munduruku, chief of the Sawe Maibi village, Maria Leusa Cosme Caba, Munduruku, women's leader, Antonio Ureola, 
report, rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples and commissioner of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Sebastian Salgado, award-winning French-Brazilian documentary photographer. Francisco Calice, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and Christian Poirier, Program Director at Amazon Watch. We've included the panelist biographies on the RFK Human Rights Awards site, so just go to the web and check them out. So uh, we don't have to spend time telling you uh, of their great achievements. So we're gonna jump right into our conversation. I have a couple of questions for the panelists and then we'll turn to questions submitted by the audience. The first one goes to Chief Juarez. In, in her remarks, Alessandra referred to some of the challenges faced, faced by your community, your fight for land demarcation, the destruction of the rivers and the forest, and the sale or use of your land by extractive companies, among others. Can you share with us, what are, what are you seeing right now in your community? What's going on right now? É, bom dia. Bom dia. É, meu nome é Juarez Almodoruku. Eu sou cacique da Sauremanguã. Bom, o desafio nosso é Munduruku, dentro dos nossos territórios, é, é, uma, é com a invasão. With regards to uh, invasion. They are taking our land from us. And this is an increasing problem lately. We have been struggling hard. They are taking our land. And this is of great concern to all of us. Our fight is hard. We've been working hard to fight for our territory, for our rights to our land. Today, we suffer so much because of that. In 2016, our boundaries had been established and the in this territory, Kapaipi, has been invaded by loggers. There is a lot of deforestation, and this is in our territory. And we have been suffering badly because of that. We have no response. We have no tools to fight them off to fight them away and make sure that our land is preserved. And all those years that we've been uh, just being witness of forest fires and deforestation and devastation, and this makes us feel so down and so worried. We know that the government, the Brazilian government gives no attention to us and they are watching this devastation and they are still supporting deforestation clearing our land and setting fire to our forests and this is making us so upset we know that we need our territory we need our land it is our land and we have to preserve it and this is just the only guarantee that we have that can we can survive and this is our future this is our land and we are not seeing anyone thinking about and we are not thinking about ourselves we're thinking about the future the future of our community the future of humankind and we don't want this to happen and the white the white man is deforesting our land and we don't want that to happen when the white man comes here and clears our land The whole world suffers for that. It is not only us, but the animals, the plants, the birds, the rivers, everything is being affected. We all end up being hurt. Our 
and they need our advocacy they need our help the rivers the plants the birds the animals this is why we need your support and this is why we need our land to be our land we have no idea of when the federal government in brazil is really going to make sure that we are entitled to our land really entitled to our land not only on the paper this is a lack of respect to us to our people the federal government in brazil should make sure that our land and our rights they are protected absolutely uh, the next question goes to commissioner antonia urejola Commissioner Urejola, you traveled with the Inter-American Commission to visit the Munduruku territories in 2018, which must seem like ages ago, given how time works these days, but was really just okay. a couple of years ago. How, how does what you hear today from Alessandra, from Chief Juarez and the others resonate with what you have seen in your work with the commission? How, how, how do the issues affecting the Munduruku relate to the wider human rights situation in the region? Um, well, thank you very much. I will speak in Spanish, um, but um, because it's easier for me, even though I speak English. But um, efectivamente, la, la Comisión Interamericana hizo una visita precisamente a los The Inter-American Commission visited that territory in 2018, and since that time on, we have continued doing the monitoring and observation of the situation of indigenous peoples in Brazil. And we have seen that one of the most curious problems of these indigenous people in Brazil is the disposal of their lands and territories. And the commission has been monitoring not only the indigenous people in Brazil, but also the peoples in the Amazonia, and we have seen a paralyzing in the processes of demarcation of indigenous territories, uh, some measures that reduce their guarantees in items regarding their territory, conditioning to possessioning of the territory, the appropriation not only on behalf of the state, but third parties alien to the territory. And we've seen a strong pressure from economic sectors related to different industries and the establishment of agricultural regulations that do not favor the people of the Amazonia. This is in a report of the commission in 2019 on Panamazonia and the indigenous people in COVID context, we've seen how all these problems not only continue, but they are aggravated by the pandemic situation. We've seen the presence of third parties in territories like mining industries, different workers, and this no doubt represents a risk to the health of the indigenous peoples and conflict and risk for these peoples. And this has been particularly serious in these months in the cases of indigenous peoples in isolation. Regarding the Munduruku peoples, I want to say that the Inter-American Commission with the former president of the commission, Francisco Rigurin, and the executive secretariat visited this territory and witnessed the presence of sectors related to the agribusiness that appropriated the lands and plundered the lands of these people. Uh, during a visit in Brazil in 2019, when the commission led by Commissioner Uri Uren went to Aceisan in Munduruku territory in this town, the delegation intervened in an intimidatory manner threatening uh, or and threatening by the soybeans producers that uh, didn't want the commissioner to get together with the indigenous community we've been knowledgeable of their efforts to demarcate their territory uh, given the lack of action of the government and we prepared the commission uh, interviewed Juarez, the 
chief of the Munduruku peoples, and they decided to do a self-demarcation for defense because of the threats by timber merchants and the plundering of the territory because their territory is what they uh, need for a living. We interviewed the head of Munduruko peoples that said that in this process of self-demarcation in order to defend themselves and defend the river and preserve the life in order to preserve their territory. I invite you to read our report on the Panamazonia peoples because we refer to these obstacles for the use of the territory that are related to their active development. We uh, talk about dams and Belo Monte projects of the Munduruku peoples and how the lands have been flooded, the lands of these peoples that are holy for them. I would close with that and I thank you for the question. This is an issue that we are knowledgeable of and we know about the actions of the Garimpeiros and illegal mining activities in the territories of the Mundurukus. It's such a long list of challenges it can get very discouraging um, and the pace of change right now has been terrible uh, we're going to get to a little deeper on some of those issues in a couple of minutes and on the solutions many of which involve support from the broader community of around the world focused on conserving both the um, indigenous rights and, and lands in the amazon and the wider biological merits of that region as well uh, there's no one who's been chronicling this uh, this challenge longer uh, than Sebastian Salgado, great French Brazilian photographer, who is here today to, uh, in his in the context of uh, a um, chronicler, a visual chronicler of of these unbelievable epic changes that are going on in that part of the world. Seb Sebastian, I'm a big fan, um, and you've been very patient and and enduring and in your work with photography. How have you seen the situation of indigenous peoples and the Amazon forest evolve since you first started? What's, what's the biggest change from, let's say, 30 years ago when I wrote this book, Amazonia in Perigo, 30 years ago, and you were taking so many great photographs. What's the biggest thing you see now that's different? You can hear me. Uh, the situation, uh about the indigenous in Amazonia, and the huge evolution in the last 30 years. Uh, you see, with the government of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, government of Lula, uh, it was possible to have uh, uh, a lot of Indian territory recognized by law, uh, come under the protection of the Brazilian constitution. And uh, uh, today, uh, Brazilian Amazonian territory represent us inside the uh, Amazonian uh, uh, bioma, uh, Amazonia ecosystem is about 26% of the Amazonia ecosystem is Indian territory recognized by law. Uh, the big problem today is that after the arrival of this new government in power in Brazil two years ago, the base uh, in where Mr. Bolsonaro was elected was no more have any recognized of the Indian territory, no more respect in the Indian uh, area protected by law, and he gave a huge incentive to the invasion of these territories as the, the Cacique Juarez from the Mandaruku just spoke a few minutes ago. The Indians are living a very hard, a difficult moment because uh, you see, if you get just the territory of the Yanomami in the state uh, of uh, Roraima in Brazil, we have in this moment that we are speaking more than 20,000 gold diggers invade this territory. We have a lot of religious organizations and men then, men of these organizations come from the United States, back in by the Brazilian government invading these territories. We have a lot of loggers. The, 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 the situation is very complicated and very difficult for the Indians now. But also something very positive 
is happening in Brazil. Never the Indian movement in Brazil was as organized as it is now. There is really a strong movement of resistance in Brazil. And what we need from a foundation, as Robert Kent, the Human Rights Foundation, is a backing for this Indian movement in Brazil, for the environmental institutions in Brazil, because it's not only the Indian territories. We have a huge amount of Amazonian territory that are national parks protected by law, and they are invaded in this moment, and more dramatically yet than Indian territories, because the Indians are reacting, and no one exists to react to protect the national parks that are under invasion in this moment. Uh, my, my wish, and I believe that the wish in the most of the Brazilians that fight for the preservation of the Amazonians and the Indian communities is that uh, we can be backed by the big international movement in order to do a pressure in Brazilian government to protect the situation. We have yet two years more to go for this government in Brazil and that we fight together to have a new government in two years that they respect the institutions, that they respect the Amazonian, preserve the territory by law, and that they, they, they respect the Indian communities. That is the real situation now. That's a very good summary. I do think one thing that's evolved also is technology and connectedness, communication capacity for the uh, indigenous communities to tell their own story directly to the outside world using everything from WhatsApp to the video connections we have you've been describing. It's harder to hide some of the uh, situation. So let's go to a special rapporteur, Khalid Say. Uh, you assumed the mandate in May of this year as the COVID-19 pandemic was in full force. In fact, your, your July 2020 report to the UN General Assembly focused on the impact of the pandemic on indigenous peoples around the world. Can you describe how the pandemic has heightened the risk indigenous people like the Munduruku people face? Thank you very much. Good morning Muchísimas to gracias y buenos días a todos. Much. Uh, uh, my colleague Antonio Rijola done before. I will speak in Spanish. And I creo que es mucho mejor por el hecho I think de... it's much better because of the fact that I can express myself much better like this. As you well know, the pandemic, COVID-19, has aggravated critically the situation of those peoples that were already uh, facing violations to their rights. Some people talked about the double pandemics, the risks for health care and restrictions to freedom have aggravated their fight to protect their territories, lives, environment, and resources from military forces or corporate actors or cyclones and fires and deforestation that have affected the south and southeast of Asia during the pandemics, the indigenous peoples have become more vulnerable to losing their lands. The legal or illegal occupation is expanding amongst these peoples. They cannot protect their lands from civil society. They have less capacity to monitor. And uh, in answer to COVID-19, some countries have increased the presence of the army and the police forces in the rural areas, treating the crisis as a safety or security problem instead of a healthcare problem. The presence of police and military forces have aggravated racism and discrimination towards these peoples. And the Corporations in indigenous territories have avoided practices of sustenance and collection of uh, products. The measures to support economies, and I want to refer to the situation of the Mundurukus people in the sense that in this emergency context, the states have prioritized the interests of the private sector, favoring the expansion of the agribusiness and the uh, timber projects and mining projects have been declared essential. These corporations have been operated so far in indigenous territories in spite of the uh, 
of their lack of consent, exposing them to a higher risk. In Asia and Latin America, the indigenous peoples have expressed a deep feeling of injustice regarding the fact that these big corporations continue with their activities and continue invading their lands and also limiting the movement of indigenous peoples and the freedom to possess their lands and to use them and exploit them. State should protect these peoples and uh, protect the advocates for human rights, the rights of the indigenous peoples. The states should know about monitoring and report abuse of human rights on behalf of uh, this should be defended. We shouldn't abuse of the powers of emergency to silence the leaders and advocates for indigenous rights. The states should reduce urgently and eliminate the presence of military people in indigenous territories. We need to stop attacks against defendants of human rights and against women. We need to make responsible the offenders and guarantee justice and repair for these peoples. The COVID pandemics is aggravating the situation of those defenseless people that face the violation of their rights all the time. The advocates for human rights at this moment, we have realized how there has been an increase in violence against these peoples and the advocates of their rights, threats, persecutions, and also assassinations that they've suffered from. Uh, in order to defend in order to say that this is a cultural if we say that they are a cultural patrimony this is a danger for the state system because they don't want to hear their voices to defend their rights being a defendant of human rights here now is putting at risk the lives of our families and our lives as well it is a difficult situation but with the presence of different international institutions that advocate for human rights, we may save a life, we may save a family, we may save a community. Thank you very much. And this is what we need. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the worst aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic is its uh, targets, particularly the elderly. And for indigenous communities, that's a repository of so much uh, of their, their true wealth, their cultural uh, wealth and heritage. Uh, Christian Poirier, uh, you've been at this for quite a while, uh, 2009, coordinating the Brazilian team for uh, Amazon Watch since that year. You've seen uh, the evolution that we've just heard, this, these cycles and now this political um, and driven turmoil around Bolsonaro. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, your sense of the role of transnational companies. And I would say for better or worse, we hear the bad part, but there, there are efforts underway for those companies to, uh, for that international flows to be more responsible. Thank you, Andy. And um, thanks for having me on this distinguished panel today. It's truly an honor. I'd like to speak a little bit about also what's underpinning um, the Bolsonaro regime's behavior in the Amazon today and how it's leading to um, the exploitation of the Amazon by these international companies. Uh, the Bolsonaro presidency has been an abject disaster for Brazil's indigenous peoples and for the health and stability of the Amazon. From day one, his regime has worked to erase a generation of socio-environmental progress, slashing budgets, gutting institutions, and openly targeting communities responsible for defending the forest. As we've heard today, his regime's deliberate mismanagement of the coronavirus pandemic has allowed um, COVID-19 to proliferate in indigenous communities with deadly consequences. Bolsonaro's refusal to follow a constitutional mandate to the market indigenous lands has definitively paralyzed hundreds of pending processes, including uh, that of Sarah Maibu, where we heard Chief Juarez speak about how his people um, have struggled to demarcate this in the face of government intransigence, and has also driven new conflicts on indigenous lands. Since he took power, there has been an explosion of violence against indigenous peoples with land invasions, illegal exploitation of resources and damage to property jumping 135% uh, in his first year alone from 2018. During this 
during his first year as well, there were the murders of seven indigenous leaders, a 20 year high, something that Francisco just spoke of. These grim trends directly impact the Munduruku, who are disproportionately suffering land invasions and whose leaders, including Alessandra, Chief Suarez and Maria Leuza, uh, routinely endure death threats from those who covet their lands. All this is occurring in a climate of wanton impunity, a true Amazonian Wild West scenario that is explicitly encouraged by the Bolsonaro regime. We can see this in the explosive violence, illegal deforestation, land grabbing and criminal arson that threatens the future of the forest and with it, our collective future. In keeping with his lawless mandate, this year Bolsonaro proposed entirely unconstitutional legislation that would permit industrial mining, oil and gas projects and hydroelectric dams on protected indigenous lands. That law, the law could be up for a vote in Brazil's Congress by early next year. And the Brazilian international, Brazilian and international mining companies are lining up to reap a bounty of new concessions on indigenous lands. Some companies like the mining giant Vale and Anglo-American have already submitted hundreds of requests to operate in indigenous lands, including in Sao Remembo itself, on which Anglo-American has submitted five requests to explore for copper. In partnership with the Association of Brazil's Indigenous Peoples, Amazon Watch is releasing a new report next week called Complicity and Destruction 3, in which we document the indigenous rights violations committed by such companies and others in the mining, agribusiness, and energy sectors. We also profile how major financiers enable this behavior, including the US-based giants BlackRock, Vanguard, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Bank of America, Voices of resistance like Alessandra's feature prominently in our report. While an explosion of industrial mining is on the table, Bolsonaro has also overseen a free for all of illegal mining as well, as Sebastian spoke about, while pushing for wildcat mines to be legalized with dire implications for the, for the Munduruku. I witnessed these impacts myself when I visited Sao Maibu last year and surveyed the incalculable destruction wrought by illegal gold and diamond mining on waterways the forest and on communities that depend on these resources for their survival. So while the landscape I describe here is highly volatile, volatile and adverse, there are some positive trends as well. As 2020's catastrophic Amazon burning season began, global financial institutions sent a signal to the Bolsonaro regime that they could no longer tolerate this disastrous business as usual scenario. Investors managing $3.7 trillion in assets warned Brazil that escalating deforestation and the dismantling of policies to protect the environment and indigenous communities are, quote, creating widespread uncertainty about the conditions for investing. Also, the ratification of a major free trade agreement between the European Union and the Mercosur blocs faces increasing uncertainty as European member states decry Bolsonaro's horrific and intentional negligence for the Amazon and its peoples. Ultimately, global markets could play a pivotal role in making or breaking his disastrous agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hope is uh, something we need to generate as well as just rely on. It's, it's an active process. And that was a very important outline of things that can be done at every level going forward. Following up on the Bolsonaro impact, I wanted to ask you about state responsibility more generally. One of the recommendations in the commission's 2018 report about the Pan-Amazonia region is that states should, quote, take decisive steps to strengthen the presence of the state in the Pan-Amazon Pan region to prevent illegal activities and safeguard the life and peace of indigenous peoples without in, in, interfering in the lives, uses, and customs of the indigenous peoples who live there. Can you speak more about the balance between state protection and non-interference in the lives of customs of indigenous people and specifically the Munduruku? Um, well, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll speak again <laughs> in Spanish. Um, well, I'm just looking for the, some of the recommendations we have on the, on the report, one minute. Um, Yes, the Pan-Amazonian report 
effectively in order to get into the aspect of the Munduruku peoples, recommends the states of the region to adopt measures tending to strengthen the presence of the states. But this presence shouldn't interfere with the lives and culture of the indigenous peoples. The report in this sense is very important. It points out to the importance that the state be present in these territories, but present to avoid illegal activities threatening or periling the peoples, but not to interfere in the lives and uh, cultures and habits of the indigenous peoples, but protect them from the interference of third parties. And this is very relevant, and we've seen it during this pandemic, to prevent dissemination of the disease, because the presence of third parties has made it more difficult for these peoples to survive. In this sense, the report of Amazonia uh, urges the states to adopt measures taking into account that the Amazonic territory is not only composed of the state of Brazil and the measures of protection should be joint protection. Uh, states should coordinate uh, in order to take measures to protect indigenous peoples, measures based on self-determination rights of these people, right to possession of their lands by them, by them, and rights for them to develop better. The report also speaks about the need for these binational or transnational measures, because for most of the indigenous peoples in the Pan-Amazonian territory, this is based on natural resources like rivers and mountains and not the limits of the states proper. The report of Pan-Amazonia recommends the states to implement measures to strengthen systems of surveillance and control for the exploitation or actions of development which are relevant for the Amazonia territory, but they should be coherent with human rights. The activities carried out there has been a constant problem for the peoples of the Amazonia and the presence of third parties linked to these projects put at peril these peoples and uh, put them at an, at an elevated risk of dissemination of the disease. We need to establish frameworks to protect these peoples with a criterion, which is the precautionary criterion to guarantee the survival of these peoples. And through precautionary principles, the states should develop preventive policies to guarantee at all times the survival of these peoples and the respect to their self-determination. By virtue of this, they have decided not to contact society and to isolate themselves. It is basic to understand in this relationship between the state and the indigenous peoples, the relationship they have with the environment from their own conceptions. For them, the good living is to relate with the environment. They need to be protagonists. We don't need to lose sight of the fact that indigenous peoples, they are entitled to collective rights the uh, free determination right. And this is important because we need to establish a balance in the relationship of the indigenous peoples with the state. And the international standards should refer to the coordinated work the states are obliged to work in coordination to protect the human rights of the indigenous peoples. But this coordinated action uh, that is stated in the UN declarations and the inter-American treaties and international treaties ratified by Brazil for the Munduruku peoples, this coordinated action needs to be based basically on their consent, informed consent, all the activities performed or activities considered for their territories must be previously consented by them. There needs to be an informed consent based on uh, self-determination. So this is based on a coordinated action 
and previous consent of the indigenous people. In times of COVID, the commission has recommended the states to suspend any consultation process and consent process because it is impossible to comply with the standards in these pandemics, but any relationship in between states and indigenous peoples should be coordinated action and we should respect the informed consent and the cultures and habits of indigenous peoples and respecting their right to free determination regarding the munduruku peoples the state has a lot of responsibilities first the demarcation of their lands second the need to establish processes of consultation and previous consent for any activity performed in the munduruku territory and basically understand that the munduruku peoples are entitled to rights they deserve respect they need to be considered before any action is performed in their territory because they have that right and this should be respected and the state should understand that indigenous peoples are a party that has a right to decide about their destiny. Thank you. Thank you. A very powerful argument for what seems such a basic principle. Uh, and now we do have a connection again to uh, the Munduruku. Uh, Chief Juarez Sa Munduruku, how important is getting legal title to the land you've and your community have lived on for so many generations going back through time. It, it seems so natural to have that right, but how important is the law and getting legal title? Well, I'm gonna say it in Portuguese. Oh, yeah, it yeah. is open again, here we go. Okay. Well, roughly saying, um, the um, title or, or the, the paper that proves that the land is ours brings us some sort of sense of safety. And of course, we have, with that, we have guaranteed the right to our land, the right to our language, the right to our culture. It is a way on the paper to show that we have our culture uh, preserved and guaranteed. And this is why it is so important to have a land uh, that uh, uh, it, uh, for ourselves and for our people. With regards to uh, the government or to the federal government projects, such as the uh, dams, those dams uh, represent a violation. Nobody checked with us. There is no previous uh, consultation with us. They want to come, clear our land, just push that over us as if we were not here and if there were no one here. There was no one here. And then, for example, this these power plants, background. We here, Munduguruku people, they never come and check with us. But the governor, what was standing, they want to come over, push us off. There are three power plants uh, already going on, and the governor never came to ask us if we were all right. So this is of major concern to us. That is why the government should come to us and ask and whatever they want to uh, develop a project, they should come and check with us prior to any move. That is why those uh, projects, they bring th this problem to us. It is of major concern. And we are also threatened. Uh, gra land grabbers come over. They threaten us. Loggers, the, logging, the illegal logging uh, industry, they remove our our forests, they, they, they clear the land and everything is happening. Even now, 2020, during uh, COVID. This is why we are so worried. We are frantic, stiff worried about it. There is another uh, project or bill. Apparently, there is. Uh, they are going to pass a bill. According to this bill, uh, 
they are going to be able to do all that. And we don't want that bill to be passed. And it is not us uh, involved. They are all indigenous lands will be affected with this new bill that they're trying to pass on the 28th of the month. And with this um, bill, we're going to be totally destroyed. And this is what I wanted to say. You're making such simple points that are so powerful that it's hard to understand how the world doesn't come to your aid promptly right away. It's been a long journey, but uh, hopefully now things can change. Uh, Mar Maria Leusa Cosmic Caba, there's a question that has come in through the internet, through all the connections we have with so many people around the world. Many are asking the same question, which is, how can we help? So what can someone in Boston or uh, in Beijing or in anywhere in the world, how can we help the most? And also your issue, your focus on women's issues, what stands out for you when you think about the role of women and making sure that uh, the Munduruku peoples uh, can re re get restored rights and have a sustainable life? All right. Good morning once again. And I would like to thank our God, Kasaiba. For those who don't know me, I am Maria Leuza Munduruku, uh, a woman uh, and a, a leader of the Munduruku people uh, from the high Tapajos River and Maderekanga municipality. I am a woman. I am a mother. I am a grandmother. And I am a fighter, a warrior. And I am here to advocate for my people. And I'm very happy and honored uh, from Sandra Munduruku, the invitation that we got from her. And actually, this is our fight. This is our world. She was uh, an example to all of us women, Munduruku women. And it is of a great joy to me uh, to uh, take in to be taking part of this movement. I have uh, been awarded in Paris 2015, so there were many cases of uh, the acknowledgement of uh, to our uh, movement uh, of peaceful resistance. And with this, we understand that women are together along with men. That doesn't mean that we are just on the uh, front by ourselves, we are along with the man. We are just clearing a path for the advocacy of our territory, out uh, the defense of our land and our people. And I would like to say a word of thanks to all partners, to all actors uh, for acknowledging uh, the importance of our struggle. And my word is of um, many things uh, because this is a permanent fight a struggle and along with chief Truarez, this is what it is this is our fight this is the only way we can go we know that we are fighting for our survival for our children for our land and for our river we want to make sure that uh, the lives of the of our children and our descendants are guaranteed and i'm very honored to be here as a woman to say that we are coordinating this movement and despite of the fact that we are women and sometimes we cannot go uh, with our chiefs to fight as they do in the position as men we are sometimes here trying to make sure that we have the vegetables growing in our uh, garden and we are taking care of our children to see them grow healthy it is very important to be part of this fight so that's what i want to say if you have questions for me of course i'm going to be uh, trying to answer all of them with this freedom because we are living, we are uh, experimenting this uh, uh, 
life and there were so many fights and there was so much of uh, the, the, the defeats and our we are all fighters so we are used to fight and we like that and this is our life Ah. can ask me more questions it's such an honor to connect with you and I would like to offer you one more question that has come in from many people around the world for the Munduruku. And maybe uh, Maria Leusa can uh, give her answer first and Chief Juarez can give his answer. The question is simple. It's what can we do? Meaning if someone is in Italy or Spain or the United States and cares to help you or in Rio or Sao Paulo, what are the things that they can do to help you? So maybe Mar Maria Leusa, uh, the final word for you, and then Ch Chief uh, Chief Juarez. We really count on our partners, especially our international partners. We want them to help us disseminate this um, lack of respect of the law by our government. Our chief always talks about prior consultation. We were hit about many of the government enterprises. They never consulted us. They want to develop, they want to build. They're creating laws which will further discriminate us. And therefore, uh, we have a convention that protects us, that protects indigenous people. We are really reacting strongly. Uh, we are going with our knives and our arrows fighting. If we don't fight against the government, they will destroy our families, our children. We have to say that we are indigenous people. We can develop our community. Uh, those indigenous who uh, defend their land are dying. They are trying to guarantee their land, but we have lost a lot of our leaders. We have different indigenous people in Brazil. We have been sharing this. We know that those who defend their land are being threatened. The government is doing this. It is the government that does not respect anybody. They are invading our land. They are planning to build power plants in the Tapajós. They also want to develop railways. They want to approve a different framework, time framework for everything that belongs to us. So whenever we talk about our land, whenever we talk about the Mundurucus, they say that we cannot demarcate our land. They are saying they do not acknowledge our people. We cannot accept it. We will always resist. We will say, no, we don't want it. We develop our land in a different way. This government is killing us. We will resist. We will guarantee that things will be done our way. We are the forest, especially we as women. We have to take the lead. We're acting. I'm not alone. We have Alessandra and other women who are struggling with us. We have other indigenous people. We have different communities and we are very hopeful that we will win. We are a majority. There is a minority that wants to come in with their machines and destroy us. Please help us disseminate this. Please keep on supporting us with these exchanges. We have 
the support of other communities. We have had exchange activities with people outside of this region. So please help us disseminate our fight. Show them what we're doing in our lands, how we resist. Support us. We're here to share our thoughts. We are being threatened. We're supporting our land. You're not going to shut us down. We have children. We have grandchildren. We generate life. We are women who generate life. You cannot shut me down. If you do, my children will have a voice or my grandchildren will have their voice. You are not going to shut Alessandra. You're not going to shut me down. We really count on your support. We need you to help us disseminate our word. We're here. As long as we live, we will stand strong. And um, our people are the ones who came before us, makes us strong. Nobody showed us the last thing we did. But we have the Telepiris power plant. Nobody showed the world that the area they wanted to destroy was the life of our children. Our ancestors were there. This is a crime. Those are sacred lands. We're here to share this word. We are indignant with what is going on. And it's not only Alessandra. There is no price involved in our struggle. They say, oh, the women are in the media because they want to make money. No, we don't want money. We want life. We want our land. We want the lives of our children who are here. So we fight for them. There is no price for our voice. The award that Alessandra is going to win only acknowledges what we're doing. We're fighting. I would like to thank you and say that our struggle will move on. Thank you very much. Wow. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Obrigado. Uh, Chief Juarez, uh, the final word from you on what the world can do in this historic moment when so much seems so hard. What are the things we could do right now? I can certainly help with the dissemination. I'm a communicator like Sebastian. So what can we do for you, the world? Uh, <clears throat> We're very happy. We're very happy to have your support. We know that we're going through hard times. We, the indigenous people from Brazil, are suffering a lot right now. The world has to acknowledge and demand the federal government to stop all of these projects that will, are bound to destroy our people, the power points, all of these things are on our way. We can no longer sleep well. There are so many projects being created by the government for our region. The world has to look at this and see that our Amazon is being destroyed. We know that Amazon is life for all of us. 
it, it, it represents the life of humankind. We have to protect our Amazon and you should demand the Brazilian government to stop deforestation or ask the white men to stop doing it. We're now suffering because of white men. They are destroying our forest. The climate has changed. And so I would like to ask the world to demand the Brazilian government to demarcate all of the indigenous land, demarcate, because we protect the forest. We know how to take good care of it. Demarcation is not aimed at destruction. We all know it. The world has to acknowledge it as well. And we have to ask the Brazilian government to stop with all of these large projects that you're creating. You're creating for our Amazon. Thank you very much. Obrigado para, para tu. Thank you very much. And it's been a privilege and a, a great honor to connect with you from such a long distance. Um, we have a couple of more questions for the other panelists, uh, but we're all here determined to act on your behalf and facilitate a sustainable future for your community. Thank you again. Now we're going to turn to uh, Special Rapporteur Francisco Calice for a couple of final thoughts and, and then Christian and some other presenters and then we'll be closing out this remarkable evening. Uh, Cali, uh, Special Rapporteur Tse, um, if we keep hearing about state responsibility. I want to take things back to what Senator Kerry said, Se Secretary Kennedy, Secretary Kerry, former Senator Kerry too, said in earlier remarks on the Paris Agreement on climate change. You identified a particular focus of your mandate, the consequences of climate change for indigenous peoples, including the prevention or mitigation of negative impacts on their collective and individual rights. You indicated that in accordance with the Paris Agreement, climate change adaptation action should be guided by indigenous people's knowledge systems and integrated into relevant socioeconomic and environmental policies. Can you speak a bit about why you chose this focus and framing and what your mandate is doing to ensure that it is guided by indigenous peoples? How do we turn this into action? Thank you again. And thanks again to the Munduruku for connecting with us so powerfully. No, thank you. Thank you to you, uh, Andrew, and I will continue also in Spanish. When I assumed a special rapporteur on the 1st of May of 2020, I remember we were in the middle of the COVID pandemics that was affecting humanity as a whole. But in my case, as special rapporteur focusing on indigenous peoples, I realized that the knowledge that I had by being member of the Committee Against Racial Discrimination, knowing the realities of the indigenous peoples and my belonging to the international indigenous movement, I realized that one of the most severe problems that the indigenous peoples would face during the pandemics was the attack to their territories. And I say plundering an attack because they are taking place in a very aggressive manner they are exploiting the lands and plundering their natural resources, the natural resources that these indigenous peoples have. And after analyzing, of course, the different, the Paris agreements, we realize that 
if there is not a policy in place, a policy to protect and rescue these lands of indigenous peoples and preserve them at a worldwide level, the indigenous peoples, we would say, in the first stage would be a danger of extinction and humanity as a whole as well. We know that Brazil, and in this case, the Amazonia area is the lung of the world. If we don't take, if we don't protect this lung of the world, which is the Amazonia, what is going to happen is that we are all going to disappear. It will be the end of humanity. Of course, the cycles of life and uh, the cycles of Earth imply the extinction of species, but no species have caused extinction like human species is doing now. And this was one of my biggest concerns, the complaints we had received at the committee about the abusive exploitation of indigenous lands by big corporations in the American continent, Asia and Africa, priming economic interests over the protection and life and biological diversity and natural resources there but not natural resources as they see them, but natural resources in the sense that these are resources that we will use for survival as human beings. All this together with the fact that this made me remember my ears as a young man. I started as an indigenous leader in my community, defending the forests of my peoples, the water resources of my peoples. And this is why I was politically persecuted as well. So the situation is that one of the key issues for me is not only the special mandate to protect the rights of indigenous people, but to respect their declaration. And one of the main points is the defense of the environment and their territories, the protection of their territories. Studying the Paris Agreement, this is included in my work plan. Therefore, this is one of the key aspects of my work plan to state it as a key issue, the protection of the environment, the protection of the diversity and the environment. I believe that the environment does not need protection. We need to be protected by the environment. We need their protection. And this is why we have to generate policies from international institutions so that the environment and biodiversity are not harmed in order to thrive as human beings. That's what I believe. Yes, thank you so much for the powerful uh, experiences through a lifetime of advocacy for the basic rights. Thank you for being part of this presentation today. Um, Christian Poirier, we're going to swing back to that what can we do question in the context of Amazon Watch, which everyone can find at amazonwatch.org. Um, what are some, what are the advocacy efforts? What are the priorities here in the US? What, what are the leverage points? And how can people make a difference for the Munduruku people and other indigenous peoples? Thank you, Andy. And I wanted to thank the special rapporteur for his words on the significance of the indigenous efforts to defend the Amazon and other critical ecosystems and what the stakes are of this existential struggle for all of humanity. As a global advocacy and solidarity organization, Amazon Watch strives to support grassroots struggle of indigenous partners across the Amazon basin. Much of our theory of change hinges on building leverage over key market and political actors globally, who often have an oversized influence on the economic and development policies of Amazonian countries. As I cited earlier, 
global markets can play a pivotal role in either enabling or moderating the behavior of the Bolsonaro regime. We've worked with the Munduruku people for over a decade, including on a campaign to stop the construction of large dams on the Tapajós River, known as the Tapajós Complex. Alongside local and international allies, the Munduruku successfully forced the Brazilian government to archive plans for the San Luis to Tapajós mega dam in 2016 in a landmark victory for indigenous rights in the country and really in the world. The Munduruku were successful in winning this unequal contest thanks to their resolute, skillful, and media savvy campaigning, which raised the profile of this polemic project and in, and in so doing, raised the reputational and financial risks for global companies that were essential to its viability. This lesson, the lessons of this case study still ring true today. In regards to our mostly US-based audience, it's important to note that there's a lot going on right now in the US and globally to amplify the voices and concerns of indigenous peoples throughout the Amazon, including the Munduruku people. As our forthcoming complicity and destruction report um, illustrates, past and ongoing violations of the rights of Brazil's indigenous peoples is enabled in part by financing from private banks and asset managers. The group of well-known US-based firms I cited earlier, including JP Morgan Chase, Vanguard, BlackRock, Citigroup, and Bank of America, seek to turn a profit by investing billions of dollars into companies responsible for pushing indigenous peoples off their lands and destroying the Amazon. Conversely, this means that clients of these firms have a key role to play in stopping this, this cycle of destruction. At Amazon Watch, we are using multiple strategies to push back against these firms. We work in coalitions with environmental advocacy and grassroots groups to build public pressure campaigns that name and shame these brands for not adopting clear policies on protecting the rights of indigenous peoples in their investments. For example, the world's largest asset manager, BlackRock, is also the world's largest investor in companies behind Amazon destruction. It has no policy for how to handle investments that may negatively impact the rights of indigenous peoples. Meanwhile, JP Morgan Chase does have an indigenous policy. However, its significant investments in companies linked to indigenous rights violations show its failure to adhere to its own principles. We believe these burning problems urge, uh, require urgent remedy and that public pressure is an effective means to get there. And it's essential that the voices of indigenous peoples are front and center in all efforts to engage with and reform these powerful actors. It, it is growingly, it's growing increasingly difficult if not impossible for these institutions to explain away the human rights violations in their portfolios. In the US, we are in the process of building out a client advocacy strategy where clients of these firms can participate in directly pressuring their leadership to change their investment practices. This audience can be a huge help to our campaigns by sharing our forthcoming or upcoming report far and wide when it, when it launches next Tuesday, the 27th. And especially if you or anybody you know uh, is a client of one of these firms, by joining our client advocacy campaign work, join Amazon Watch in our mailing list to receive our report and tap into our finance campaign work at amazonwatch.org. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And uh, the work you do is incredibly important, that kind of pressure. And I think it's more doable than it has ever been because of transparency that can be imposed on companies. And we just have to all get involved in making sure that the Munduruku can make their own voice clear. Sebastian Salgado, you've been trying a new strategy, not just photography. Uh, you're helping to propel a, a petition that already has 300,000 signatures urging leaders in Brazil to protect indigenous peoples in the country from the COVID-19 impacts, which can amount to a genocide if not stopped. Can you tell us more about the impact of the petition so far and how people can hold leaders accountable? Yes. Uh, in May, in the month of that of the COVID-19, was we and Brazil come inside Brazil, we organized one international appeal. We ask uh, tens of uh, important people around the world, the Nobel Prizes, big artists, big architects, uh, uh, film producers, intellectuals. We create a real, a very important list of people that sign one, one appeal to the three Brazilian powers. 
the executive power, the legislative power, judiciary power, applying them to create one uh, belt of protection for the Indian territory. Because uh, you see, when Brazil was discovered 500 years ago, today we can calculate that you had a population of more than 4 million Indians, indigenous people inside Amazon. Today, we are about 330,000 only. Majority of these indigenous disappear by the contact with the diseases come out of the forest. And the COVID was real, real, a, a big problem and a big danger for all this population. Of course, uh, we had a, a huge impact in Brazil with this appeal. With Lelia, my wife, we bought a space in the most important space in Brazil, double page, and we published this appeal. And uh, the impact was enormous in the Brazilian society. Of course, that we had not a reply from the executive power. The presidents of Brazil don't care about the Indians in Amazonia. They don't care about uh, the protection of the Amazonian territory. They want uh, to destroy all this ecosystem for the ecosystem or for the economic uh, 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 power in Brazil. And the uh, legislative do not reply us. But from the judiciary, we have one amazing backing. And uh, we create uh, a fabulous uh, organization with the judiciary. From there, was possible to create, uh, to participate, create and participate in a huge uh, uh, health movement called Union Live Amazonia, where it was possible to obtain donations from all over the planet. And we carry planes and planes and planes of medical uh, 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 backing for the Indian communities, transportation by river, by helicopters inside the areas. And uh, uh, was was very interesting, this. But uh, you see, this international backing for this appeal was essential for us. As uh, Maria Leuza said, as the Cacique Juarez said, as everyone, uh, Christian Poirier said, we need the international backing in this fight to protect Amazonia. If we don't have an international participation, it will be very difficult for all institutions, for all indigenous organizations that fight for Amazonia. Our big hope today is that in two weeks, the power in the United States change. If you have a change in power in the United States, uh, we are 100% sure that we can change the way to fight to protect Amazonia. That's our big hope. That is a big hope and uh, such an urgent need. By the way, as you were speaking, I signed the petition. <laughs> I went on the web and I'm going to promote it as much as I can. Uh, the, uh, that actual work on the ground also to get the help where it's needed is crucial. Uh, thank you so much for what you're doing, Sebastian Sagado. Um, we are uh, pretty much out of time. We were hoping to uh, get in a couple of more points, but um, this is the end of a what's a wonderful evening, inspiring, connected evening, showing the power of the internet, <laughs> despite all of the compromises it has put into our lives uh, and the pandemic the, to generate a global community around critical issues. This is all the time we have for today, everyone. Congratulations again to Alessandra Korap Munduruku, the 2020 RF Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award Laureate, and to her comp comp compatriots there, uh, Chief Juarez, Maria Leusa, um, our, uh, Gra General Chief Arnaldo Caba, and the rest. Thanks to uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry for his keynote address, and to all of our wonderful panelists. There have been some great takeaways from this evening, actionable concrete steps that we can all take to sustain the peoples of the Amazon who help sustain the forest for the rest of us. Finally, I want to say thank you and good night to all of you who tuned in and who will help share this message going forward. We appreciate your being here and hope you stay safe and well. Thank you. <laughs>